mailbag. Nothing personal word of the day. It's the mailbag episode. We do this at the end of every month. Thank you very much for all your questions. Here's what you've done. You've gone on Apple. You've rated. You've reviewed. I guess you rate five stars. You write a review. And in the review, you ask a question. And once a month, at the end of every month, I answer a bunch of questions different from So You Want to Talk to Samson. These are sort of more what we call lasting questions, like evergreen questions, general questions, general thoughts. I appreciate all of your participation, all of your loyalty that you've shown throughout 2020, so much so that Coca has informed me that we'll be doing a double mailbag. So one now, and there'll be another one before the end of the year. Just you wait. I want to get right to it because way more questions than what we have time for, but there's some good ones. So let's start. First question. With all of your experience with law and sports, did you ever think about becoming an agent? So when I was first getting into baseball, this was in 1999. The first manager we had was Philippe Alou. And we had an idea that Philippe Alou would not make it with us. And soon after we started, he was let go and Jeff Torborg was hired. And Jeff Torborg managed through uh, part of 2003, moved from Montreal to Florida with us, et cetera. Jeff Torborg has a son. I haven't heard or spoken to him in ages, but his son's name was Greg, not the son who was the strength and conditioning coach and who was sort of a wrestler type, but a son who was a lawyer and did some arbitration work, did some agent work. And I remember thinking before I had even started my career about what it was to be an agent, because remember, I'd been a fan of sports and sports business my whole life. Lucky enough to have been a Nick fan, been to Nick games in the 70s, 80s, 90s. I don't like saying 70s, it makes me feel old, but it's true. And I always focused on things that weren't necessarily the focus of other people. So that can be sort of lonely, but I was pretty young and I was thinking about my life and what I wanted to do. And, and I've told you that I went to college and tried to get a job out of college with a friend of mine's father in Chicago. He did not give me a job. So I went to law school and how that changed my life. I told you in law school, I thought about being a district attorney, didn't get that job. So I started a business in Europe delivering newspapers. And we've talked about the fact that all of the failures I've had, and there have been a plethora, have led to successes. And frankly, that frame of reference of failure and success without one, you cannot have the other because you wouldn't know what the other looks like. And so I was one of those, I never went to a career counselor, but I always thought about what would I enjoy? And I knew what agents did. And before I got into sports, my view of agents is that they were these incredibly powerful people who spent time with athletes. How cool is that? Because I had spent time with some players when I was a kid and I would genuflect in their general direction because that's all I wanted to be was a professional athlete. And I knew that to be an agent, you had to be a lawyer. That was a smart thing to do. And so I thought to myself, wouldn't it be amazing to represent these players and make money without having an actual skill of doing the sport? And I knew that agents were responsible to negotiate contracts. Agents were responsible to take care of their clients in good times and in bad. I never really understood until I got into baseball what the biggest job that an agent has. And that is recruitment, poaching, and babysitting. Three things that I don't like doing. Let's start with the third one, babysitting. Agents will tell you that they're not babysitters for their players and they won't be telling you the truth. They're responsible. They actually hire people below them to make sure that their players are behaving, to make sure that their players are where they're supposed to be, to make sure their players are rehabbing if they're hurt or staying healthy if they're healthy or working out in the off season, getting ready. They're responsible to make sure that family issues are taken care of any sort of legal issues are taken care of. Agents are the people who get the call in the middle of the night when there's a problem. 
agents are the ones who get the call when there's a light bulb that's burnt out in a house of a player. Poaching is what you do. And I realized that poaching is something I've always done. When I was on Wall Street, one of the great jobs you have, you're taught that to get a client is way harder than to keep a client, which is why customer service is so critical because it is way cheaper to keep a client than to invest in getting a client. However, getting new clients is one of the metrics that is used for your compensation. So I focused very hard when I was at Morgan Stanley on getting new clients. And every client I got was working with another firm. And so in theory, I had to tell the client, potential client, here's what I will do for you. And by the way, it's way better than what this guy's doing for you. And agents are poaching all the time. They're calling players and saying, hey, you work with Scott. He's only gonna get you three years at 10. I'm gonna get you four years at 12. Hey, you're working with John or Seth or Joe. Just so you know, when you're good, they love you. When you're bad, they can't stand you. And I'm here to tell you that no matter how you're playing, you are my number one priority. Think of Jerry Maguire. Right when he left his firm and he's calling all his clients and Jay Moore is trying to get his clients and it's a mad rush to make phone calls. Who's going to get clients? That's really what happens. That doesn't seem that much fun, especially when you don't need to do it from a compensation standpoint. Recruitment. Do you know that agents are out looking at players all the time? They're looking at players in Little League. They're looking at players in high school. They're looking at players in college. They're looking at players in the Dominican, in Japan, in Korea. They are always looking for players to fill their pipeline. It's a, again, like Wall Street, you fill your pipeline with clients, just like I taught all of you how we would want to have people in our pipeline of fandom and brand affinity, starting with knowing that there's a team in your city, ending with being a full season ticket holder. That's the pipeline of sales. There's a pipeline in agency as well with agents. So I never really thought about becoming an agent once I knew exactly what agents did and then every day of my career, 18 straight years, dealing with agents every single day, dealing with Scott Boris, dealing with people like Scott Boris, having the pleasure of dealing with great agents like Joel Wolf, Giancarlo Stanton's agent, dealing with agents who would lie, dealing with agents who would cheat, agents who would do anything to get you to give more money to their players. My view of agents became such that each day I got further and further away from that fleeting desire as a child to ever be an agent. I recognize they're a necessary component of the ecosystem of sports. I have an agent now. I love my agent. His name is Jerry at UTA. He's amazing. He's not like the other agents I've come into contact with. He pays very much attention to me when I'm going to be a free agent. And the day after the contract is signed in February with whoever we sign with, Coca, that'll be the last time we hear from Jerry until the next contract. No, I'm just kidding, Jerry. You know I'm kidding. Anyone out there in sports media, I strongly suggest Jerry. So to answer your question, I do have experience in law and sports. And with that experience... I thought less and less like carbon dating down to zero. But there's one theorem above all that I subscribe to, and you know it, never say never. Okay. Ooh, yeah, we chose this one. This was, okay. What is your reaction to people who really only know you and the Marlins for trading away any player worth value? That's a personal question. This show is called Nothing Personal, but I'm gonna get personal because I wanna answer your question. I don't think that until you are made fun of mercilessly in public, until you are heckled walking in a stadium, 
until you are on the receiving end of ridiculous death threats that you have to take seriously. I don't, I think it's hard to explain what it is to be public. And I've told you I'm a G level celebrity, maybe H. Although keep subscribing and downloading and listening and maybe Coke and I'll get up to D. Maybe Survivor at that moment, I was a D. But that was three days and 42 minutes. I spent a lot of years in front of the camera. And I began to understand perspective. I've always enjoyed movies, you know that. I've always felt as though when I meet celebrities that I've known them because I've seen them on TV, you get the feeling just because you hear somebody or see somebody on a screen or through a computer that they, that you know them. I had that feeling. I always had that feeling. I always found it strange when I would meet people who I'd seen on the screen that their reaction to me is one of, A, I don't know you, B, you don't know me, and C, I'm saying hello to you because I have to. You're the president of a team. I want free tickets. I want to meet some players. Sometimes you get to know the person individually and you become friends. Sometimes you become acquaintances. Sometimes you have a moment and you share that moment. I've had a chance to share a lot of moments. And I realized that I kept judging people by my interaction with them as it related to my view of them prior to any actual interaction. I would see someone on screen play a character and then I would meet them and wonder why they're not like their character. Wonder why they were grumpy, why they wouldn't sign a ball for me, why they wouldn't take a photo, why they wouldn't want to have dinner. And then I gained the perspective on the other side where when I would meet people, I would give speeches, I'd meet them in the ballpark, I'd meet them in meetings. And they came into those interactions with preconceived notions about me that were not based on anything other than what they saw, what they heard, and what they thought it meant. And I found myself having to explain every day why I did what I did, what my job was, and that I was doing my job. I wouldn't mention Jack Nicholson's line from A Few Good Men. I was doing my job and I'd do it again. I found myself telling people, like excusing my behavior, which wasn't always perfect. I made mistakes publicly, too many to mention. The opposite of Frank Sinatra. Although I wouldn't say they were regrets, but just too many to mention. My reaction was never one of anger or frustration. It was always one of exasperation. I would say to someone in a very disarming way, and I would be nice and calm, sometimes funny, very direct. Sometimes people would perceive that my being forward or being direct was the same as being an asshole but that's not what I, who I am or what I am at all. I'm intolerant. I have frustration tolerance issues. There's no question about that. I work on those every day. Well, once a week. I've got a complex where I am very prepared for no one to like me. And I have this amazing, almost Shakespearean desire to be liked for reasons that I'm probably years away from understanding. But the reality is that my reaction 
is that I wanted to change everybody's view of me until they knew me, understood me, and then I didn't care what their reaction was. So I want to explain that subtle difference. I don't need to be liked by everybody. What I need and what I crave is for people to not like me for a reason that is logical, for a reason that is correct, and for a reason that I presented to them to give them the right to not like me. Let me have the opportunity to prove to you that I am who you see or who you hear or disprove to you who you see and who you hear. When you come up to me and tell me that you don't like the trade in 2012 with the Blue Jays, you don't like the fact that we never won, even though we're in the World Series ring, that you don't like the fact that we didn't finish above 500 since 2009, that you don't like the fact like Billy Corbin, who doesn't like the fact that I got public money in a public private partnership for a ballpark. Before you judge me, be in my shoes. We spent an entire year of 2020 with the systemic racism and the racial inequalities, making sure that you understood that I was never trying to say that I could walk in the shoes of anybody except myself, not my kids, not the people I've worked with, not the players, not managers, not owners, not commissioners, not fans. The only shoes that fit me perfectly are the shoes that I walk in every day. And I don't judge you for the decisions you make from your perspective. I can give you my opinion and I do it on nothing personal. And it is nothing personal. I can tell you why I have that opinion, but it's never about the person until I get to know the person and then make that decision. And then you could say that's personal. So my reaction to people who really only know me through the screen or through the microphone or through trades is that I don't think about it. What I do think about is taking the time to block and tackle, taking the time to meet people everywhere I go, to introduce myself, to look at their face when they hear my name and see my face and hear my voice. When I see them judging, there's not one person I won't take the time to try to explain who I am, what I stand for, what's real, what's not real, and then I let it be. That's my reaction. <sighs> hey. I got to tell you, I love the show. Thank you. I'm taking a year of parental leave with my baby girl. While I love every minute of it, I still look forward to the distraction of 45 minutes of engaging in insightful sports talk each day. Love the MLB stuff in particular. Simple question for you. I copied and pasted the beginning of that question, even though that wasn't part of the question. So thank you very much for that. I will, let's keep going, right? We might as well keep going. Following the new Jays stadium story, you know, I'm big in Canada now. And what irony is that? And dreaming of what might be. Do you think the trend of building old school stadiums will continue? Is this model economically feasible or attractive to owners? Thank you for asking about stadiums because times are changing. Let's talk about the cyclical nature of stadiums. Back in the day, Stadiums were built. They were multi-purpose stadiums. You had football teams sharing with baseball teams. You had some domes. You had some open air facilities. Stadiums were built back in the old days with just bleachers, not even backs to seats. And then they evolved. Then you started realizing that owners realized you make more money by having premium sections. Then there was a whole suite revolution where you build suites, people buy suites, they congregate together and overpay and you make them buy overpaid food over cost. What's the word Coke? I can't even think of it. By the way, Coke is doing the mailbag episode, not getting paid for this overtime. 
Sorry, Coca. It'll be okay, I promise. I promise. Then you had stadiums getting bigger because there were certain teams selling out and they felt that they wanted to have more seats. Then you had stadiums getting smaller when they couldn't sell out the seats. Then you had stadiums having fewer suites because people were not interested in suites the way they used to be. Then you had exclusive areas bigger because people wanted the better seats and were willing to pay for the better seats. Then you had concept of all in where you buy the food in advance, all in parking food, throw in a free shirt. Then you had stadiums built to look like old stadiums. Then you had new stadiums looking like new stadiums, Marlins Park being one of them. Then you had new stadiums being built to look like the old stadiums that used to be like new Yankee Stadium looking like old Yankee Stadium with everything but the inside and the prices. And the question you're asking is whether or not the Blue Jays are going to try to replicate the Toronto Sky Dome. No, is the answer to that. Then do you think that owners focus on old school stadiums and whether or not it's economically feasible? Well, here we go. There is only one thing that we have in mind when we build new stadiums. Two. One. Well, it's all cost and benefit. What is the least amount of money I can spend on a ballpark to extract the most amount of revenue so that the profit margins will increase and our in-stadium revenue will increase so our payroll can increase and the value of our asset can increase? That is why when you're building a new stadium, you go on tours. You tour stadiums all over the country, all over the world. You look to see best practices. What are other owners thinking? What are leagues thinking? Now we are in a time of COVID. The entire new stadium frenzy has now changed forever. My prediction is that new stadiums that are built are going to be built smaller. My prediction is that new stadiums that will be built are going to be built with a viewer in mind, not the in-person fan. My prediction is that when new stadiums are built, they will be built in such a way not to reminisce about old times, but to be so technologically superior that a viewer watching on TV will have the feeling, and I don't mean through VR, will have the feeling that they are not missing anything by not being at the game. One of the great sales points of in-stadium attendance is that you are a part of something, that you have been there to share a moment that you don't know when or what it will be, but you know that there's a chance. And you take that chance by going to the game to cheer with a group, to boo with a group, to experience something new with a group of strangers. It's like a family. Everyone wants to be part of a family. Everyone wants to be part of something. But owners now realize that that experience that people used to pay for, they're not paying for anymore because the experience has changed so much inside stadiums. COVID will make it so that mingling even after the vaccine so crowding into areas, I'm thinking like the bleachers at Wrigley, crowding into areas like down in the first three rows during batting practice, you can get foul balls and autographs. All of the things that we used to love and sell to you are going to change. Therefore, when you are building a new stadium and there is always a cycle of new stadiums, the Blue Jays, the Diamondbacks looking for a new stadium, for Christ's sake, Marlins Park is almost 10 years old. It is over 25% done with its original lease that we signed back in 2009. Unbelievable, actually. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. This is the 10th season of Marlins Park. If I had to build Marlins Park over again, there'd be fewer suites because we can't sell the suites. 
There'd be fewer seats because we cancel out the seats. There'd be closer dimensions, getting more people closer to the field than even they are. There'd be different points of sale, different concession areas, bigger kitchens, bigger video board, better camera angles. Do you know when we built Marlins Park that we were more concerned about fans' views than camera angles? And it ended up costing us because I don't like the angles, the camera angles at Marlins Park. New stadiums will have way better camera angles, way better technology for the viewer at home. What used to be the new stadium bump does not exist anymore. The automatic revenue and attendance increase. The money is in broadcasting. Now, baseball and other sports have spent the entire COVID telling you how much money they're losing by not having fans and stands. And it is true, whether it's 30 or 40% of your revenue, it is a huge number that comes from fans attending games. But what we're learning is that post COVID, we've got to switch that balance. There's another dollar Coca pre 2021. They've got to switch that balance because it's the broadcasting deals that are going to become a far, far bigger percentage, both local and national, of total revenue. Because we learned that overnight, at the drop of a snap, attendance can disappear to zero. We've learned that when your team isn't performing, that there really are only one or two markets where fans will still come, and maybe not even that. We've learned that in this era of launch angle and young players being far more important than pricey veterans, that keeping your window of competitiveness open longer is more difficult than ever and only one or two teams are able to do it like the Dodgers and Yankees. We've learned that the one recession-proof part of your business is your broadcast revenue. So when new ballparks are built, I assure you that it's not about old school versus new school. It is simply about economics and taking care of your biggest client, which is not the fan in the front row. It's the broadcaster. Thank you for that. Okay, did you ever discuss your next question? Did you ever discuss your daily routine on nothing personal? running, watching movies, etc. And if you haven't, can you give everyone your routine? So I'm a very big routine guy. So here's my routine. I unfortunately am afflicted with phone itis. I sleep with the phone charging next to me. And I sleep with the phone on vibrate. So here's the routine. Let's start with the end, like Tenet, which I reviewed on a recent Nothing Personal show, starting backwards, going to the beginning. To go to sleep, I take sleep gummies. They're like a brand, I think it's called, I'm, they're not a sponsor, so I'm not gonna say it's Charlotte's Web. And I'm not gonna say they have hemp in them, but they may. Two gummies, and then either an Ambien, a Tylenol PM, an Advil PM, an Aleve PM, a Xanax, some combination of a cocktail that will help me fall asleep for my normal two to three hours a night. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So the routine is I get into bed, but before I get into bed, every night, no matter what, literally no matter what, Literally, no matter what shape I'm in, I brush my teeth, I then wash my hands, I then put water on my face, wash my face, dry my face, dry my face, dry my hands, go to the bathroom, get into bed. That's post cocktail. Sometimes I do some ambient texting. Sorry, no ambient broadcasting though. Some ambient phone calls every once in a while. Not smart. Don't do it. No ambient driving, of course. No ambient golfing. 
My eyes generally open a few hours later at most. And the first thing I do is look at the phone. Then I go to Twitter to look at any update on news. I go to CBS, I go to ESPN, I go to TikTok, I go to Instagram, I go to Facebook, I go to the New York Times, I go to the Daily, to the New York Post, I go to the Miami Herald, I go to Yahoo. I do it in an order that is on my phone because my phone is completely alphabetical in terms of where the apps are. So I go one at a time and you wonder why I can't fall back asleep. I've got a paper and pen and pad, the nothing personal pad, which I'm showing you on YouTube if you're watching this on YouTube, and a pen. I write down topics for a show that I'd want to cover. I look at DMs to see if there's any good questions or anything I can answer immediately. I then put the phone back down, stare at the ceiling, try to fall back asleep. If I can't fall back asleep, which is 80% of the time, I start watching a movie or a TV show, sometimes reading more articles. Then at the first sign of light, and this is critical because I don't like the dark, the first sign of light, I am out of bed. The first thing I do in the morning is I recheck the phone. I go through that exact process, get more topics. I look at the show that had been prepared the night before, get ready for the conversation with Coca about the next day's show. Then I get dressed. I get dressed in a very particular way, in a very routine way. My shower is the same every day, every way. I turn the shower on, then I brush my teeth, then I go to the bathroom, then I get in the shower, then I take the soap and wash my hands, left arm, right arm, stomach, chest, south of the border, rinse, back, rinse, tushy, rinse, left foot, left calf, right foot, right calf, left thigh, right thigh. Then I do underarm left, underarm right. Then I go south of the border again because you wanna be clean. Then I go underarm again, left, right, hands wash, soap down, rinse, facial cleanser, rinse, second facial cleanser, rinse, shampoo, rinse. Then I've got a sprayer to spray south in front, south and back like a bidet. Then I turn the shower back on, rinse, left arm, right arm, face, hair, shower off, dry off, bathroom, then I get dressed. Getting dressed for me is very easy because everything is in line. I take the piece of underwear on top, the socks that are next, the shirt that is to the left, the blazer that's to the left. I sit down here and I do a show. After the show, Coca yells at me because he had a problem with six things I did. I go through them, I tell him he's right, I try not to do him again because he comes up with six more the next day. Then I prepare the outline of the next day's show just with word of the day. So you wanna talk to Samson, review, nothing personal, pick of the day, wait to see, and they're all blank. And then during the course of the day, as I'm reading and thinking about things, I work on the show. Then five days a week, when I'm training, I go for a run by doing that. I have a training regimen where it's either four miles, five miles, six miles, 10 miles, 12 miles, 20 miles, whatever it is, go for a run. After the run, do the shower routine again because I will not put on clothes after a run until I've showered. When there's no show, by the way, the run is before the shower because there's no show to do on, a, on days that I don't do shows, which are not many. Then, I watch the movie of the day. I make sure I get it done. It's during the course of a day. Sometimes that bleeds into the nighttime. Sometimes that bleeds into the overnight time or I'll watch a second movie or a second TV show. If I'm knee deep in a TV series that I can't wait to get back to like a book, I wanna get back to as quickly as possible. During the course of a movie, I judge that movie based on the number of times I interrupt that movie by pressing pause and going through my phone. And when I go through my phone, I go through the same 10 apps to see what's going on. Then I've got a list, because I'm a list guy. The lists go on the bigger pads. This is the bigger nothing personal pad. The list is of things that need to be accomplished that particular day. Phone calls I need to make, car inspections, whatever is on that, a doctor's appointment, 
a follow-up, a call, whatever has to be accomplished. You know from previous mailbag episodes, I do a short-term, a mid-term, and a long-term list. I make sure I look at things from my long-term list every day, don't always work on them. My midterm lists, I work on at least something from a midterm list every day, and I make sure my short-term immediate list is done by the end of every day. You'd be surprised that it sounds exhausting what I'm saying, but it works. It really does work. Then nighttime routine. Now you're wondering about food. I do not have a routine for food. I do eat Special K dry with peanuts, with cheese and crackers. I also eat salads and juices and drink juices, eggs. I'm not a big food preparer. I don't really spend time. I have a friend who will light candles and cook for hours and sit and read a book while eating. To me, I view food like gas. I need gas, so I'll eat once in a while. I also didn't mention because it's unhealthy, but I guess I got to mention it. Uh, I weigh myself about five times a day, which is not smart. Uh, there's, I do it at certain times so I can compare before going to the bathroom, after going to the bathroom, before eating, after eating, things like that, because I want to make sure that I'm not gaining weight, not losing weight, well, trying to lose weight, but et cetera. So life is a lot of routine. So I appreciate that you asked that because uh, there are some people, and Coca may be one of them, he's probably dying right now because I'm not sure normal people have that level of routine, but I don't want to say normal. That's not true. I'm perfectly normal. Can't you see? Okay, what's next? Oh, I think we got to do this, Coca. Okay, here we go. Someone asked me whether or not I would make any predictions for 2021. The question was, do you have any predictions? So I want to talk about 2021 a little bit and end this mailbag episode with this. We have almost made it to 2021. We are so close. We can feel it, can't we? 2021 has such a great chance. Every new year, everyone says to a happy and healthy new year. May next year be better than this last year. That's sort of what everyone is supposed to say, right? I've never felt that more than I do now. 2021 needs to be better than 2020 in every way. We need to learn the lessons taught in 2020 and apply them in 2021. This is a bigger issue than it's ever been. So here I am, there'll be another mailbag episode, but in the second to last mailbag episode, what I'm gonna do is give you my 10 predictions for 2021. It's sort of like wait to see, you know, on the regular show, and thank you so much for downloading and subscribing. I really do appreciate that you do that. Just hit subscribe whenever you do. You can unsubscribe and resubscribe on your podcast. I think that counts, though. I don't know. I just, I hear Levitard say that, or maybe it's Stu Gatz who says it. On YouTube, please just make Jerry happy so he doesn't call me. Hit subscribe. Wait to see is when I tell you something's going to happen and I'll revisit it. I've got the following wait to see predictions for 2021. Let's start with what all of us are thinking. When are we going to be able to go back to a sporting event? When are we going to be able to go to concerts and have it be filled with people? Get in the mosh pit, get Springsteen back on tour. It's going to be the fourth quarter of 2021, and you're going to need proof of vaccine. I'm sorry. What's, it, what's the guy's name, the tennis player, Coca? Um, Novak. Uh, he's the most famous tennis player of all time. Novak Djokovic. Djokovic. He's, I think he doesn't want to get vaccinated. My prediction is this. To go to a sporting event, to go to a concert, you are going to need proof of vaccine like a proof of age when you go into a bar. It may even be something that's on your license. It may be a separate card, but you will need proof of vaccine to attend a concert 
or a sporting event once capacity is allowed to go to 100%. That is a prediction. Wait to see. Number two, and I don't want to be negative Nelly or Debbie Downer. I'm sorry to all the Debbies who are listening. That's such, that's, it just, it's an alliteration. That's why. MLB has a problem. We've spoken about it on Nothing Personal many times. The collective bargaining agreement ends after 2021. There is still a major negotiation that needs to take place between baseball owners and the players regarding 2021 season. Forget the fact that they need an agreement for 2022 and beyond. Major League Baseball players are so scarred by losing so badly in the last collective bargaining agreement that they brought in Bruce Mayer, who is there to fight only. It's like when you hire a lawyer who you know is not a settlement lawyer. He's a litigator, and he will take you to court. He's not there to settle. That is what Bruce Mayer is, the new hire for the players. He is not there to make a deal. Unfortunately, there is going to be a work stoppage after the season. After this coming season, it will end up being a lockout by the owners, not a strike by the players. The owners will lock them out before the players even have a chance to strike. I'm not ready to say that there will be any time missed in 2022. But I am ready to say there will be a work stoppage after 2021. My third prediction is Jerry Jones. Even though the Cowboys had a great win over the Eagles and the Cowboys actually have a chance to win the division of the NFC East, which we covered on nothing personal. I don't remember when we talked about it. It could have been Monday's show where we said that if the Washington football team wins, they're in. But if they lose and the Cowboys beat the Giants, the Cowboys can still win the division. I already have a wait to see that the Cowboys are going to miss the playoffs. I am doubling down on the wait to see because I think Jerry Jones after this season is going to have to admit his failure and he is going to give up the GM title. That is a prediction. Jerry Jones is going to bring in someone to help him run the football side because he's going to take a deep, dark, long look at himself and say, man, I hope my owner isn't paying attention because as GM, I have sucked. What about my Knicks? The Knicks who beat the Bucks 130 to 110 the other night. The Knicks are going for their first title since 1973. I became a fan in 74. How's that for luck? It's like being born in 2003 in Miami, and now you're going off to college without ever having sniffed. Oh, well, yeah, sniffed playoffs last year, actually. Jim Dolan owns the Knicks. Jim Dolan has been a failure as an owner, off the field, on the field, in terms of winning. He's been a huge success in terms of building the value of his asset. But I believe that Jim Dolan, after the season, when the Knicks again have not gotten the free agents they wanted, they again are going to miss the playoffs. Jim Dolan will finally admit failure. Sorry, folks. He's not selling the team. Jim Dolan will give up no power. He will continue to meddle with his guitar and the Knicks are doomed like the damn groundhog to six more months of crappiness. Let's stay in New York with the Yankees. The Yankees have had amazing stability in the front office. Brian Cashman has been the GM since what is it? 98 Coca 99. Brian Cashman's contract runs out after next season. The Yankees will underperform again in 2021. They will not win the World Series again in 2021. And there will be major changes on the baseball side. Brian Cashman will be gone. And Aaron Boone will be lucky to keep his job. Hal Steinbrenner is giving that group one more year with Garrett Cole and Judge and Stanton, et cetera. New York Yankees will underperform in 21 not win the World Series, and changes will be made on the baseball side. Another prediction. Remember how we talked earlier in the show about stadiums and how they're going to get repurposed, and they're going to be repurposed for viewers' purposes versus in-stadium attendees? Well, you know, because of COVID, there's a lot of issues in the commercial real estate space. 
all the big box retail retailers are in trouble. Everyone's doing everything online. Commercial real estate is in real trouble. My prediction is 2021, even after the vaccine, you will see a repurposing of commercial real estate into housing. You'll see a repurposing of commercial real estate into anything other than commercial real estate. So for your strip club, strip club, <laughs> that's funny. Strip mall owners, those people who are landlords with commercial tenants, you better start thinking about what else to do with your land. The government may be helpful, but commercial real estate will start to get repurposed and that will start in 2021. How about Amazon? I read on Darren Ravel had a tweet that Amazon had $1.6 billion in sales in 19 something, 90 something. Now they do 1.6 billion in sales every 36 hours. That's hearsay, so I'm not saying it's right or wrong. But Amazon is obviously, obviously, a behemoth in a way that we're just beginning to understand. Here's what Amazon will do in 21. They will continue to expand their services. No doubt about that. And here's what they're going to do. They will start bidding. We watched a football game on Amazon Prime, uh, NFL game on Saturday. The middle game, Cardinals Niners, was on Amazon Prime. Guess what? Amazon is going to become a major player in bidding for both local and national TV deals. If you think that CBS, NBC, ABC, and Fox are gonna keep a monopoly on all of the deals for professional sports, nope, Amazon's coming to get you. Next, you know how we work remotely? Yeah, workplaces will continue to allow remote work even after the COVID vaccine is in place. Office leases are going to be broken nationwide. All of the office buildings where people have attended, where attendance even in New York City is at 10%. Office leases will be broken. Office spaces and office buildings will be repurposed the way commercial spaces and commercial buildings will as well. It's going to happen. You know what else is going to happen? Derek Jeter is going to get into the Hall of Fame this year, and there will be a Hall of Fame induction, and I got a prediction. Derek Jeter will take the microphone, and I guarantee you that he will thank George Steinbrenner in his speech. He'll talk about the boss. He'll mention the role George Steinbrenner played in his life. And I can equally guarantee you that he will not mention me. He may flip the bird but he will not mention me. And my final and 10th prediction for 2021. Get ready. Here it is. Matthew Coca, the great producer for Nothing Personal, the person without whom there is no show. There's, you're not listening to anything without Coca because I've got nothing to say without Coca. I got nothing to do without Coca. I made a deal that if we could get a hundred new downloads from Bismarck, North Dakota, that we would send Coca to Europe. I've heard from many of you in North Dakota, more people than I thought were there, that you are fans of nothing personal and I'm extremely appreciative. Matthew Coca has no interest in going to Europe. Very little interest in leaving his apartment. But I predict and I promise you that in 2021, Coke is going to Europe. And guess what? For me, that's just good business. This has been the Mailbag episode. <laughs> For me, with Coca, it's just business. This has been the mailbag bonus episode for nothing personal.